On guard. Working with Stanley Kubrick was long, intense, and thoroughly enjoyable. I think every day I treasure. I look back on it now thinking I could, have, I could do it again, you know, but only with him. I don't think I could take that long with too many directors that I know that well, but you know, I learned a lot. Sometimes it's like getting paid a little bit of money for going back to school working with him because he was so inventive and interesting. I never realised how much I learned until I lit a film on my own, and then it come back to me, and it like somebody was looking down at me, telling me, ah, oh, ah, oh, that's it, you say, ah. Oh. And he should look up like that and think, I remember that, Governor. People ask if I've worked, uh, um, if I've the same experience with other directors as I did him. I think not, because uh, th there's only one. <laughs> I always read scripts these days and plant what I think is a, a visual concept of it. Uh, Barry Lynn and I thought to myself, well, all right, so it's, it's a costume drama. It's been done before, you know. But I know as a fact that they're nothing they've ever shot in Canada like look good at that time anyway. And that's, that wasn't easy 45 years ago. The candle gives its own glow. It's a kind of warm, reflected light kept look to the luminosity of it. It was just impossible to shoot. I mean, the candle stuff was completely different. He'd show me pictures prior to the film and say, this is how we want it to look. You know, oil paintings, and you say, OK, right. It's not just a question of getting exposure, it's how that exposure relates to the scene. And if it's a kind of pastel and essence look you want to try and achieve, then the lenses are the important thing of surrounding it. So he is a photographer at heart. He loves the camera and he always tries to find a different way of making it work. We had found lenses in Germany, made by Zeiss. There are five of those lenses. Stanley has three of them. Stanley's the only one I've ever worked with with so much control and so much power. He, could, he would order stuff and he'd get it straight from the manufacturers. He'd ring up and someone would open the door or lift the phone and it'd be there. The lenses actually uh, uh, were produced by Zeiss for NASA for very low light, deep space photography. So they were never designed really to be used for cinema, right? So we had to then make them fit a camera of his, which he owns. The only lens that that camera would go on to, of a sound camera anyway, was a, a type of this BNC. That's the only way we could find it would work, but it meant kind of um, not destroying the camera so much, but reconstructing it. Because the lens, because of its construction, the real element is something like four millimetres from the film plane. Well, in between those four millimetres, there has to be a gate which holds the film in place and a shutter which revolves in between. So it had to be very close to form the image, so they had to get back into almost the film gate, which is an aperture plate which had to be machined back to receive the lenses so they could get to the film plane and create a focused image for us, cinematically, you know. And so they were sent away to have that adapted and remounted and blocked by the Ed de Julia in you know, the cinema products. It was very, um, but quite inventive. Which Stanley paid for himself. I think somebody of Stanley's technical qualities and also knowledge appreciates that sort of thing because it, it, it took quite a while. I think it took something like possibly could have taken maybe two months, three months to start that idea off. And there are not many people who have that time mm -hmm. to achieve that, you know, that aim of getting something constructed like that. And then even whether it's going to work or not. Well, when you first see it, you think, that's never going to work. But we did so many tests, it had to work. I mean, every night, I think, Doug shot tests and every shot we'd done, Stanley used to take a Polaroid. Normal lenses are all, you know, calibrated, where these lenses weren't calibrated at all. Doug had to do everything. He knew so much about the camera and the lenses and different things. And that's what Stanley liked. That's why he had the same people, because they knew it. 
second, you know, it's a second nature. I mean, Stanley was the quintessential master of lots of things, but he had to iron out a lot of difficulties, like when he orders lenses, which are so fast to shoot with bad lenses, the difficulties are maintaining a standard of excellence to keep them user-friendly so that we can get on with the film without having delays with a lot of focus issues, you know? The lenses, there was no depth of field. Doug had to pull focus on. I mean, if I was sitting in there film, me, you wouldn't like that, he's out of focus. You can see what you're looking at through the viewfinder, but we couldn't judge the focus. You cannot be answerable to being that accurate without some device, and this device was vented by Stanley, he had a CCT camera, and he thought, well, if we put it next to the taking camera, but on the, on the side preview, I would know from where I'm sitting, watching the actor, where he's moving forward and where he's going. So Ryan would be doing all this, and every move he had, I made a note on the monitor I had of the picture the CT camera was giving me, and I put a grid over that and marked off every distance he was seated at. So the amount of movement he could do, I could follow, and so I've, I've nailed him every position, I think, that he's likely to go to, right? Without him being stuck in a, uh, um, I don't know, a head brace where, you know, looking like some um, uh, talking puppet, but... I, I, you, you have to allow the actors to act and move around. We had no video assist on what we were shooting. This was 40 years ago. Until the laboratory processed the, uh, the images, the latent images came through and came back, that it was OK, all right? That, you know, with film, you just have to know it's going to be right or wrong. We did have a lot of problems with the candles anyway. The candles were burned down very quickly. We would have to refuel every time to the continuity of the... And they give off an enormous amount of smoke as well, atmospheric smoke. So when you got the scene, you would open all the windows, put the plenums on, extract all the dirt and dust and the, the, the smell, because people, you know, eat up oxygen. We had so many candles, I mean, there was no oxygen in the room, so you would uh, fall asleep. So, yes, everything you had to sort of shut down, regroup and, and uh, go, back to, go back to number one and, and go through the whole process again. You are sometimes lonely. Sometimes. The ambient light in the room is everything. Everything falls away too quickly. It's not shaped to it. it Candlelight don't travel very far. I always say it was an illusion. If you see five candles there, you're sold the idea that the light's coming from the candles. And if you look at some of the scenes, how was they so bright in the background? We had a bit of ambience bounce off the ceiling to, to bring it up because the four candles or five candles you see, behind them were 20 candles in a film game. But you don't see them. You've been sold that idea that the candles are flickering. They are lighting it, but there's a bit of a backup there. Lou had this idea of putting reflectors to the ceiling of these rather stately homes because we wouldn't have burned the place down. There's quite a lot of smoke produced from these candles and a fair amount of heat. You have to be careful. And there was not a set built on that movie. There were all real locations, priceless locations, often open to the public every day that that ambient light was reflected back into the set itself. There's still a semblance of some illumination in the background, so you're still reading the wallpaper, the texture of the door, the paint, the carpets, the ceiling, the whole, the whole thing is there recorded at a very low level, but conceivably real enough to believe that it looked real. Scenes were constructed from paintings when I say paint, paintings, setups, setups themselves were constructed from paintings or drawings of that period. He would say, "You see this picture, Lou?" And he said, "That's it." I said, "Well, that's where they should sit." So the light will come from there. And he said, "That's okay, okay." And we'll try that. Lots of the scenes were shot with the source of light coming from the windows. The whole picture was shot during the winter. Well, that's too short a day. So we would start with the sun, because most buildings that we shot in, they were designed and built in those days so that they get the maximum light is shining through the windows. When the light began to fail, then we could switch on our artificial light and continue shooting. So you cheat the source, you sell the idea of how the light's going to be, and it, it would look like natural light, but there would be paper frames and mini brutes behind it, so you had a soft light source coming through. Or if you didn't like that, 
you could take them out. And you had hard lights here as well, a different light source completely. Great big arc lights. So it was never really natural light. It looked oh, like natural right. light. Hello. I see you're alone. Why don't you come over and join me? Uh, well, thank you, Barry. You're very kind, but I'm expecting someone to join me soon. I went to the barn where they have the jewel, right? So he said, go and have a look at the barn and see what you think. So I went to the barn, and there's 28 holes in the wall, roll round. So he said, what, what do you think? I said, well, I think behind Ryan is the same both ends, right? Right? And round there were 28 holes, so I said, I'm going to put a light through every window. I just looked like that. Arc lamp, so you got it. If you wanted a show off the light, you could have it. I was just lucky, you know what I mean? I came up with the right answers. But I think most of the places we went to, that was quite, that was all right, easy, easy peasy, really. Because Stanley, he understood photography. He had so much camera gear. I mean, John said to me once, Stanley would have made a very good cameraman. You know, he has a little sort of uh, viewfinder. So the lens you're doing the movie on for that scene would be attached to the viewfinder. And then to have the correct format, the ground glass was marked up the same as the taking camera. So basically you were getting the camera positioned exactly. And who would know if it wasn't the same height, but him, he would. He would operate a lot himself, rather than he did most of it, I think. He does a lot of, when it's handheld, he, does, he likes to do it himself because he can see it himself, he can see his results, especially on handheld. The Aeroflex was designed to hold in a certain way. I mean, that's the way it was designed. But he found a way of holding it, which you might say is a kind of um, uh, a pre-steady cam, which was much simpler, much, much, um, much easier. And, you know, I mean, there's the only person I've known out of everybody that could operate a camera could, could hold it as steady as what he could because of, because of finding another way. But whether it was because he had an instrument of his own vision plastered so in, incurably deep that it couldn't be translated to a normal person like myself, it had to fit his mind's view of what he wanted, and um, this is why he did it himself. It had to be so precise to the meaningfulness of his vision. I think it's, it's extraordinary how that was the case. Stanley had this 20-to-1 uh, zoom lens, which he quite liked to use, which was a, a 24 to a 48 millimeter, which we used to a large extent on this as these sort of slow, imperceptible moves going backwards and backwards and opening up and opening up. We never use the word zoom, it was varying the focal length, he preferred to call it. I think it was like a picture within a picture. Every part of the zoom was a picture within itself. The zooms weren't used as zooming and, and getting from one position to another. Most of them were actual compositions, if one remembers starting on the guns <laughs> in the jewel down by the, 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 the water edge. And then if you stop every frame, you'll find every frame is perfectly composed, <laughs> is a setting within itself. <laughs> I think it was used that way, not because of a zoom, but to tell a story without cutting <laughs> and to make also the flow of the picture, which was a very mellow, and, and, and soft, everything was soft. I could print every frame of that movie, frame them all and have them in every room of my house. And I still wouldn't get bored of looking at these pictures. It was a delicious feast for each eye, I would say. You can't get enough of it, visually. I don't think we could do a Barry Lyndon today. It takes time to work these stuff, you know, properly, to make it cinematically uh, um, gelled. To excite those silver halide crystals and get these images is something magic to me still. And when you think of a, you know, a single ray of light, really, from the a die of a film, you know, has multitude of colours, many more still than you would get with digital, which are predetermined artificial colours. They're getting there. But the thing about the looks of Perry Linden are the tones of the same colour at different levels of the shade of that colour. If you get a green, you've got dozens of different shades. The tapestries of the sets, and the costumes, you see were vibrant. Not vivid, not chrome up, contrast down, but were vibrant. They were real. To me, that's a standard um, example of how we should achieve perfection in cinema. Thank you.